right. Some nice kids, I bet they have very <laughs> proud parents. I'm a little biased. That's right. Um, so uh, when, I was, when I was youth minister, uh, I had a lot of times that I got to talk with teenagers about their, their dating relationships, and they're trying to, to find their way and who they need to be with, and um, it, was always a, it was always a fun part of, of that, that job. And there was one particular day that I was having lunch with a teenage boy, and it became very clear as he began talking about this relationship with he was in that he needed to get out, right? Like, it was very clear he, he wanted to, to, to break up, but he didn't know how to do it, right? They had been dating for a long time, and, and we spent about an hour processing all of it. And he finally came to that conclusion. He said, yes, I see it. I see what I got to do. And I gave him some advice. I said, uh, don't send a text message. <laughs> you know, older generations are like, yeah, duh, but... No, it does not go without saying. I was like, don't send a text message. Go talk to her. I had some other pieces of advice, like, you're not going to make her just be okay with it, so just the less, is, less is more. Say, this, is, this isn't what's right for us, and, and make your way. And I remember watching him, him walk out of that restaurant and get ready to go, to go meet with, with this girl, because he was, he was just burdened and trying to figure out, how am I going to say this? Because what I have to do is really, really hard. Now, the, <laughs> the rest of that story is that he, he did just that. He, uh, he met her um, as she was coming in from school. He, um, he, he said, let me talk with you. He sat down and talked with her. She, she was very upset, but she seemed to take it very well. He headed to his car, and she... <laughs> She came out just as he started up, and she said, hey, and she had a large smoothie, and she like slammed it on his truck and exploded everywhere. So it went uh, not like he anticipated it going, um, but nonetheless, uh, their relationship uh, had ended as it had needed to. But I often think about that, that process, like that, that moment where you know you've got to do something really, really hard, and you have to to begin making your journey to have that conversation or do that difficult thing. And it could be a, a trip that you need to make to a doctor and you're not ready for what that conversation will, heart, will, will hold. Or it's a, a relationship thing where it's either you, you had to, to break up with someone or, or you had a friend that you needed to confront about something. Hard, hard conversations that may have a drive or a preparation to get there. And there's a lot of moments in, along the way where you want to run, right? You think, okay, what's, how, how can I get out of this? Uh, how can I make them do it subconsciously? Like, <laughs> passive aggressive work at this real hard. How can I, how can I convince them somehow uh, subconsciously to do the work that I need to do? Uh, you may decide to run. Like, let me, can I just avoid this? Is the situation really that bad? Uh, for my friend in a dating relationship, uh, they were either going to have to break up or get married somewhere down the road, right? Like, so he had to decide, is it, is it now or, or never or, well, or, or later? Do I just hold off when I know I need to do? But there must be a compelling reason why. Why is it that I am going to go through this hard thing. Why is, there, why is it really important? Uh, I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I mean, uh, those of you who are around have, have noticed I, I lost some weight. Um, one of the things that was most important in that was not picking a target weight and beginning to work towards it, all right? It was, it was sitting down and sketching out, why do I need to do this? And the whys uh, are not really reflected on the scale. The scale ma measures some of that, but the whys are like, what, what kind of life is it that I truly want? And so, so for me, um, one of the, the, the profound whys was uh, remembering times that I had tried to be active with my son. We had gone, gone mountain biking, and he hated being behind me because I was so slow. <laughs> and I, I just felt so much shame and frustration about that. And I said, I don't want to be slow. I want 
to be active with my son. Um, last, uh, last summer, I had a, a chance to go with go hiking, go into Colorado with some, some, former, some former students from here, and we went, we went hiking one day, and, and I huffed and puffed up and down this mountain, and there were multiple times that they stopped, and were very patient and kind and waited for me, um, but I was carrying an extra 100 pounds, so it wasn't quite fair <laughs> than they were, and, and I, I just remember being so frustrated. It's like, I want to be able to, to keep up and be with you. Like, those were, those were powerful whys. It wasn't just that I, I, I wanted to, to get healthier, because I, I did, that I wanted to live longer, and I, I do. Um, it wasn't that I wanted to, to look better. I mean, Kate stuck with me, <laughs> right? So, so, so I got that. You see us together, and you go, that is a woman who loves what is on the inside of people. <laughs> um, <laughs> know who you are. And so it wasn't about that, but it was about the kind of life that I knew I wanted to have. And so when the moments came up where there was a new flavor of Bluebell ice cream sitting there taunting me, saying, doesn't this seem like a good idea? The real answer was, yes, in this moment, it does seem like a good answer. But my why was much bigger. The life that I wanted to have with my children and with my friends and with my wife was bigger than, than that bowl of ice cream or that pizza or, or whatever it might be. Uh, there, was another, there was another big why. And I, I, I'll tell you this, this was a, a, a hard one, and I'm just being um, authentic here. I, I became very aware that my physical, pres- my physical appearance was not congruent, did not reflect the sufficiency in Jesus that my preaching proclaimed. And that was, it was, it, it was a clear indication of what was going on inside of me and my dependence. And so on the other side was, was not being able to put, put up a, a better facade, but to be internally congruent with who God has called me to be. Whys do that. They, they drive the success. They make it to where you're willing to go through something difficult to get to the other side. Now, I, I'm sure that you've been in those situations. You've had those, those hard conversations uh, with friends, with, with people that you might have been, been dating. You've, you've made some kind of trip where you said, all right, this is what I'm going to do. Or you had, had a life change you needed to make. It might have been like me and been weight loss. It might have been some other health factors or, or mental health uh, adjustments that you made. Um, they were hard things, but you made the choice to do it because on the other side was something way more important than the pain it would take to get there. We see this in Jesus as he makes his way to the cross. Let's, uh, I, I want us to go here to Matthew chapter 26, uh, because this helps us understand Jesus right before he is arrested. Uh, before, before he's arrested and then eventually crucified and tortured and beaten and humiliated, he has a time where he goes in the garden to pray. He's met with his friends, they've celebrated the Passover, and he goes into the garden of Gethsemane. And it says uh, here, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So Luke will actually tell us that as he's, he's praying, he had, he had sweat drops like, like blood pouring off of him. Jesus is in great mental anguish because of what he knows is coming. Now, sometimes we're, we're quick to... Um, make this a, just a theological thing. 
Like Jesus died for, for humanity. He took my sin so that I could go to heaven and, and be with God. And I think that's true. And we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. But we see here that Jesus is in emotional turmoil. He's not looking forward to what he has to face. But he's sub- submitting to God and saying, if this is what has to happen, I'll do it. Jesus knows what's coming. And there's other passages that help us understand this, but Jesus has always known what's coming. So as I mentioned at the beginning of service today, we, we recognize Palm Sunday. We, we remember the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem with shouts from the crowd, hailing his entrance into that great city. It was a party atmosphere. People were celebrating the Passover that they had come from all over just to be there and celebrate this together. And so we see this here in Matthew 21, starting in verse 6. Uh, Jesus had just told them about a, a donkey that would be tied up, and he said, go get it and bring it to me. And it picks up here in verse 6. It says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So Jesus, as he's coming in, he's surrounded by all of this excitement. And they recognize, at the very least, that he is a prophet. He's there on behalf of God. He is, he is gonna speak on behalf of God, and they've got this energy about him. Now, they thought he was coming to be an earthly king, and they thought they were welcoming the king into the capital city. Uh, many of them did. Others may have just been in a crowd and decided to start shouting along, as people in crowds do. Whatever the case, this is something that seems like a victory. But I imagine that Jesus is aware of the city that he's entered, that he would not make it out without being killed. Jesus is entering Jerusalem, but he's on his way to Gethsemane, to that prayer where he says, I know it's here. Is there any other way? Jesus is entering the city on his way to Golgotha, to be raised up on a cross. And I think Jesus knows that. Um, I I, I loved this this reading before because it it highlights that piece that even as people are shouting and they're excited and they're supporting, those fickle crowds will turn on him. One day they'll shout, Hosanna, and the next they'll shout, crucify him. And it will happen very quickly. And Jesus knows as he rides into town that that is coming. He's been making his way to Jerusalem to face this for for some time. Um, It says here in in Luke chapter 9, this is is one of the the key incidents I've had in in Scripture in in recent years. Uh, In Luke chapter 9, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Entering into the city of Jerusalem was not something where he decided, okay, now this is the end game. He began in chapter 9, making his way and marching towards his death, whether people recognized it or not. Uh, In the book of Luke, that's 10 chapters later. Now, it's not a straight line. There's a lot of other things that happen. But in his entire ministry, Jesus is continuing to move forward as he makes his way to the cross. Even from birth, it's been headed this way. Why? What would move Jesus for his entire life to be moving towards something that was going to be so painful? 
This is a very long drive to a difficult conversation, right? This is, this is a very long travel to get to something painful that needs to be moved through. It's more than theology, right? It's more than just the, the understanding of Jesus needed to be the sacrificial atonement so that we can go to heaven. Jesus gets that, and he's going to do that. He's, it's more than showing that he's going to be a victory. Uh, he's going to be a victor over sin and death. It's true. He's going to do that. But it's more. He came to, to set a, a great example for us as his followers. But he's not trudging step by step just to be a good example. It's a lot more. This uh, scripture Hudson just read from Hebrews 12. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfect of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, the other side of the cross, the other side of the pain that he was going to experience was something that would bring him joy. It wasn't just, let's, let's balance the ledger sheet. Jesus was moved by great love for his people. It's not an obligation to blind obedience. It's something that Jesus knew would bring great joy to him. Now, Scripture tells us this other places, but I love how Paul expresses how he understands Jesus' march to the cross. He says this, he says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, for Paul, that march to the cross was personal, right? It wasn't just something that had to happen. He knew that Jesus died because he loved him. You are his why. You are Jesus's why. Paul knew, I am Jesus's why. The reason that Jesus marched to the cross, the reason that he continued that long journey to face unbearable pain was because he loved me. Jesus loves you. We give, we, we, we preach on Sunday mornings and we have Bible classes but the most important theology and message that we teach is one that we give to our smallest children. And we teach them to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And I think most of us spend our lifetimes learning that message. A truth with this is that Jesus isn't just recognizing that there's a lot of people he loves to make it worth it. Jesus' death is for love for each person individually. You. You. Singularly. We're enough for Jesus to be willing to die. Jesus was willing to die because he loved you, not just because he loved his creation, but because he loved you. He gave him, loved me and gave himself for me. What if we really got this? Right, like I said, I, I think we spend our lifetimes learning that Jesus loves us. I remember a moment for, for myself, it was probably about 12 years ago, where I, I looked in the mirror and I went, but you know what? Jesus loves you. I had, I had a Bible degree. I'd grown up going to church. But there was a moment in which that message sunk just a little bit deeper. Because I think it is something we continue to learn. And as we learn it, as it sinks deep into our heart, not just as we know it, but, but we experience it, it changes us, right? Being loved in general changes you. 
Yeah, you, you learn that you, you have a responsibility to someone else. Uh, anyone who's, who's had a child gets this, right? Like you, you have this, this unconditional love from this, this little child that was brought into the world and you go, I can't, I, I, I can't be immature anymore. Like I, I, I can't mess around in this, this life anymore. There is a lot at stake. This person cares about me. When you are loved, it changes you when you see it. Y'all, we have a whole world of people who don't know they are loved by anybody. They have relationships. They have, they have people that help them pass their lives by but they don't know if there's someone who would die for them. Someone who cares if they're hurting. Someone who wouldn't abandon them when it got difficult. So many people don't know that. They don't know that there's a Jesus that was willing to die for them. There are many fragile and broken people around us. Uh, something that's, that's been on my heart recently has been, has been men. Um, has been, been men in, in our church community and the community around us and the messages men get about who they're supposed to be. And I'm convicted about how fragile and broken men are and unable to share that. What if they embraced their calling in Jesus? A calling that is a gift through love from Jesus. How would our world be different? And that's not limited to men. How would our world be different if the, the women and the mothers around us embraced that their identity came from Jesus and it was poured into them as a gift of love? How would our world be different? How would our, our high schools be different if it was filled with teenagers who knew that they were loved? And as they began making decisions for what their life would look like, it flowed from who Jesus made them. If we don't tell them. The world needs to know that there's a Jesus who loves them. Listen, today, first, recognize that you are loved. That's it. You, you, you can go ask the, the, the children next door. They know the message. They can preach the sermon. Let it sink in that you are loved by Jesus, and he went through all of that pain and all of that hurt because he cared about you. Know that you are loved. And know that that love is a great gift that is meant to be shared. Actually, when you get the first one, the second one is not that difficult. When you know that you're loved, and that that love is available to anybody, you're ready to make sure other people see it. Let's pray. Jesus, as we, as we talk about what you, you went through, that you intentionally moved towards the cross, and with each step, you knew what you would face, and you kept going, because the other side was joy. The other side was, was hope. The other side was relationship with us. The other side was love. Jesus, thank you for that gift of love. I pray for this church and everyone in here that each of us will know that love. Not, not with just our heads and our knowledge of your word, and the teachings we've received, but we will know deep in our hearts that love. 
That love will consume every bit of us. And God, as we interact with the world, may we be known as people who recognize that they are deeply loved by Jesus. And we're recognized as people who are constantly looking to share that love with others. It's hard for us at times to accept that we are your why. But God, Jesus, we thank you that we are. And it's in your name we pray.